family my name is Sherry Wright and this is my husband Anthony and we're so excited and would like to welcome you to the ANC Couples Corner where our theme is let's stay together our vision is to equip empower and enlighten couples with the necessary tools to fight for their marriage now this is a place where we will laugh and learn plan activities have discussions and we will also go on dates so uh, Sherry and I have been married for 24 years and I would love to sit here and tell you that it's all been peaches and cream because it has not. I had my share of mistakes, she had her share of mistakes, but here at ANC we have great examples of godly leadership and how to love one another through it all with our Bishop uh, Jonathan L. Woods and Lady Nicole Woods. So if you're so, if you're not a part of the ANC Couples Corner, please email us at ancouplescorner at ancfairfield.com. So, let's have fun, let's gain knowledge, and, and let's, let's stay, stay together. together. What's up, family? Thank you for tuning in to another worship experience. Listen, this is your eCampus pastor, Pastor Chris. And as you come into this service, you know that we need your help sharing the gospel today. So as you come in to view this service, like this service, and share this service on your personal page, tag someone's name in the comment that you know needs a word from God. Listen, we're getting ready to go into the sanctuary now.
Good afternoon and God bless each and every one of you that have joined us tonight in the sanctuary of All Nations Church. Welcome into our virtual service. Our experience in God tonight is going to be life changing. I can't wait to share the word of the Lord with you. As always, you guys know what I need you to do. I need you to give me some hearts and some likes in the feed now. Let's get some love going in the feed and then I want you to go to the bottom of the page and share this service on your personal uh, social media page and then come back and I want you to tag some names in the comment section that you know could use a good word from God tonight. I have a wonderful, amazing word from God that I believe in my heart is going to be life-changing to each and every one of us. Can we get into a mode of worship tonight as we get ready to lift up the name of Jesus? Always remember Jesus, Jesus, always remember Jesus, Jesus, always keep him on your mind. Will you lift your hands half mast where you wherever you are? Let's sing together now. Always remember, say Jesus, Jesus, always remember, oh Jesus, Jesus. Always keep him on your mind. Clap your hands and give him praise. God bless you, everybody. Listen, tonight in the month of May, we have been talking about reviving the standard of holiness. We've been talking about reviving the standard of holiness. And tonight I have a word from the Lord for you. We're going to be talking about honest worship, honest worship. As we get into this lesson tonight, one of the principles of holiness is worship. We must realize that God expects worship out of his people. When God placed Adam in the Garden of Eden and he allowed Eve to join him, he created them for his pleasure. He created them to uplift his name. And he created them to be an example of who he is in the realm of the earth. When you study the theological aspects of the Bible, when you go throughout the different books, the different testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament, you will find that there are angels all through the Bible. Angels are messengers for the Lord, but they also serve primarily to stand around the throne, to fly around the throne, to kneel around the throne of God and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. They were created to simply worship God. One of the greatest uh, faculties in the church, one of the greatest experiences in the church today is our experience of worship how we can come together corporately, praise and worship the name of Jesus and uplift God. It's a beautiful thing. But many times, ladies and gentlemen, what we must understand is sometimes our posture of worship becomes antiquated. Not only does it become a antiquated, but our posture of worship, it becomes subjected to a routine mentality where we learn how to appear to worship and we learn how to look like we're lifting up the name of Jesus but in our hearts we're drifting away from God and that's what we want to talk about tonight because as we revive the standard of holiness God is calling his creation back to sincere worship 
And as we come back to this place of sincere worship, we must understand that we must gain a broader view and perspective of worship. Worship is not just the lifting of the hands. Worship, ladies and gentlemen, is, is not just prayer or praying or communing or meditating with God. Those are attributes of worship. Yes, they are. But ultimately, we're going to discover tonight in this particular lesson but that sincere and honest worship carries with it a lifestyle of worship. That means then that our worship transcends the sanctuary experience and it becomes a decision. It becomes a thought. It becomes a posture that we are in 24 hours a day, seven days a week. As we get into this lesson tonight, I want to read a passage of scripture from St. John chapter number 4, verses number 21 through verse number 23. Jesus is having a discussion with the woman at the well, a Samaritan woman. The Samaritans were half Jew and half Gentile, and the Samaritan people, according to their culture, and the Jews, they had no dealings with each other. There was a racial divide between these two different ethnical groups. But here Jesus, being a Jew, has a detailed conversation with this woman at the well, according to the context of John chapter 4, who has had five husbands, and the one that she has now is not her husband. Jesus is having an, an intimate conversation with her as it relates to worship. And they begin to talk about the geographical location where the Samaritans worship in the mountains and the Jews worship in Jerusalem. And there was some dissonance as it relates to what was the correct way to worship God. And Jesus says in the in the 23rd verse, he says, believe me, woman, the time is coming when you Samaritans will worship the Father neither here at this mountain nor there in Jerusalem. You worship guessing in the dark. We Jews worship in the clear light of day. God's way of salvation is made available through the Jews. Watch this, ladies and gentlemen. But the time is coming, it has in fact come, when what you're called will not matter and where you go to worship will not matter. It's who you are and the way you live that count before God. Your worship must engage your spirit in the pursuit of truth that's the kind of people the Father is out looking for. Those who are simply and honestly themselves before him in their worship. God is sheer being itself spirit. And those who worship him must worship him, must do it out of their very being, their spirits, their true selves in adoration. Look at what Jesus is saying to the woman at the well. He's saying, we Jews, we know what we worship. You Samaritans think you know what you worship. But let me tell you that God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What I love about it is in verse 23 when he says, it's who you are and the way that you live that count before God. Now, in the earlier verse, in verse 22, he talks about how the time is coming where it's not going to matter who you're, what you're called or who you're called, how people refer to you. We're in a season and time in our day where God is tearing down denominational divides. He's literally getting 
rid of the lines of divide in the kingdom, the lines of race, what color you are, what side of the tracks you're from. God is unifying the body of Christ. And he's literally saying what really is going to count is how honest is your worship. That's the kind of people the father's looking for. So the father is seeking honest worshipers. God can find many people, ladies and gentlemen, that will lift their hands, but honest worshipers have to be sought for. Whenever something has to be sought for, this simply means that it is not laying on the ground or perhaps it is not easily seen. It is something that is relatively rare and possibly even hidden. I want to talk about this tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because God says as we restore the standard of holiness and we revive the standard of holiness, God is calling us back into the place of having purified worship, worship that really, really matters. First of all, we must realize that according to this particular text, that God is a spirit. Anything that God receives has to flow from your spirit. Because man is a trichotomy, we have the ability to offer God things from any three of our natures. We are body, soul, and spirit. So it is possible to offer God something from our body, which is our flesh. It is possible for us to offer God something from our soul, which is our emotions and our rationale. It's the seat of our feelings, the place where we get preference. And it is possible for us to offer God something from our spirit. Our spirit is the essence of who we are. Our spirit makes up every aspect of who we are. It is the eternal part of us that God gave us that will survive even after death. God says he is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Now, let me pause parenthetically to really give you an understanding of what this means. When you worship God in spirit, that means you get beyond your flesh. That means you get beyond your soul, which is your feelings. And you get to a place of communion, sincerity, and the intimacy with God where everything in this natural world, you have overcome it. It's no way for you to have a worship experience if you're not able to get over your fleshly desires. There's no way for you to have a worship experience if you're not able to forgive and get past those that you don't like and those who have agitated you and frustrated you. You cannot bring your baggage into worship. You have to strip yourself of all flesh. You have to strip yourself of all emotions, all emotional complications and difficulties. You have to strip yourself of all mental anguish and negative thinking. And when you get stripped of all those things, Nothing else can matter to you in that moment but you having a divine encounter with God. When you get to this place, ladies and gentlemen, where you are, are thoroughly and intimately focused on God to where you're saying, I want you, God. And even if that means there's some things I have to let go. There are some people I may have to release or forgive or perhaps 
there's some things that I may have to push to the side for now. Give me you, God. Everything else can wait. When we get to this place of sincerity, that's when worship occurs. They that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to travel to the book of Isaiah. Tonight we're teaching from the message translation. I want to begin at chapter 1 and verse number 10 because we're going to see here where in the very inception of the book of Isaiah, God is rebuking Judah and Jerusalem because of their hypocrisy or their, for lack of a better term, their fake worship. See, ladies and gentlemen, God's trying to pull us out of having a religious face, having a church face. God's trying to pull us into a place of sincerely living for him, sincerely worshiping and serving him. Notice what he says, beginning at verse number 10. Listen to my message, you Sodom schooled leaders. Receive God's revelation, you Gomorrah schooled people. Why this frenzy of sacrifices? God's asking, do you think I've had my feel of burnt sacrifices, rams and plump grain-fed calves? Do you think or don't you think I've had my feel of blood from bulls, lambs, and goats? When you come before me, whoever gave you the idea of acting like this, running here and there, doing this and that, all this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship. I want to pause right there, ladies and gentlemen, because in verses 10 through 12, we see God frustrated with Judah and Jerusalem. He talks about rams. He talks about bullocks. He talks about the system of atonement that he had set in place during that time. Whenever someone did wrong in Israel, the priest would have them bring a ram or bring a bullock or bring a dove and they would kill those animals as a sacrifice of atonement for their sins. They would offer up an oblation unto the Lord because of what they had done wrong. And the problem was, ladies and gentlemen, that when this happened, the children of Israel began to abuse this process. They began to use this process as a religious act where in their mind and in their heart, they had no intentions on changing. It became a game to them. It became a religious act. I want you to look back at verse number 12 because in verse number 12, we see the Lord really correcting them. And he says, why this frenzy of sacrifices? Why are you constantly lifting your hands, running around the church? Notice what he says. Whoever gave you the idea of acting like this? Who deceived you into thinking that I'm the kind of God that wants your scraps. I just want you to, to laud my name. I want you to celebrate who I am in the face of people. Do you think that's really what I want? He said, look at verse number 12. You're running here and there. I run. It's nothing wrong with this. Please understand, when he tells them to bring the oblations, when he tells them to bring the sacrifices, these are the things that God wanted, but God wanted them brought with a sincere heart. He said, you're, you're coming into my presence. You're running around the church. Oh, you got to dance. Oh, you've got to shout. I mean, it's a mean shout. You know how to cross them up. 
You know how to look like you're having a moment of authentic worship. He says you're doing this and that. All this sheer commotion in the place provided for worship. Now what he's showing us is loud shouting, loud dancing, loud music, all the excitement that we experience in church. He's showing us that none of it is worship if it's not accompanied with an honest heart. In other words, I'm not worshiping for real if I am holding in my heart an alt against my brother or my sister. I'm not worshiping God for real if I'm harboring hatred in my heart or if, if I have it in my mind that after I come out of worship, there are people that I'm not going to speak to. I don't like white people or I don't like black people or I don't like Asians or Hispanics or my family members. God is teaching us that all of that is good, but it doesn't matter when it's not accompanied with an honest heart. Verse number 13 says, quit your worship charades. Just stop it. And that's what God is saying today, tonight rather. As we deal with this series of reviving the standard of holiness, the Lord is saying, let's stop putting on. Let's quit acting like we love him, but we really don't love him. The scripture declares, ladies and gentlemen, according to the word of God, the Bible teaches us that the Pharisees, with their lips, they drew nigh him. But their heart was far from God. Notice what he says. Stop your charades. I can't stand your, triv your trivial religious games. Whenever we come into the body of Christ and we come to church and we claim to be lifting our hands, but we dog each other out. We claim to be entering into moments of sincere worship, but we hate on other denominations. We put down other churches and other church leaders, and we are mean and grumpy. We mishandle God's people, ladies and gentlemen. God's saying, I can't stand the trivial religious games that a lot of people play we give to be seen sometimes and sometimes we do things to be heard but notice he says I don't even like your monthly conferences your weekly sabbaths your special meetings 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 have we asked ourselves what are we doing did COVID not teach us a lesson that we've got to learn how to come together in sincerity and in truth? The meeting is irrelevant if it is not authentic. There must be an authentic purpose behind our gathering. He says, you're having meetings up on top of meetings. And notice what he says, I can't stand one more. God is saying tonight, no more meaningless gatherings. If you're going to hold that out in your heart, don't even sing. If, if you got it made up in your mind that you're going to rebel against the order of God, don't go through the the process of faking it like you really love it. He says, meetings for this, meetings for that. I hate them. Can't you hear the anger of God? Notice what he says in verse number uh, 14. You've worn me out. I'm sick of your religion, 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 while you go right on sinning. Now, here's how we are returning back or reviving, rather, the standard of holiness. 
After we sing and after we dance, after we cry, we've got to live the life. It's time to cut some stuff off. It's time to walk away from some stuff. And ladies and gentlemen, I need you to understand that sin is the, 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 the transgression of the law. One scripture says, all unrighteousness is sin. Did you not know backbiting was a sin? Lying is a sin. There's no such thing as a partial truth because partial truths equate to whole lies. These things are sin, 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 sin. God's not trying to condemn us. He's not trying to shame us, but he's trying to get us to see that he has greater for us, that he's chosen us, that he's anointed us. And because of that, we've got to walk in victory. We've got to walk in might and power. Notice what he says. You, you, you go right on sinning after the praise break is over. You still going to chase after that woman's husband. After the song is done, you're still going to chase after that man's wife. We're, we're not talking about weakness tonight, ladies and gentlemen, because some of us have been overtaken in faults, things that we didn't want to do, things that we prayed against, but we still fell into temptation. God's not talking about those type of people. He's talking about people who have no intentions on honoring him. Those are the people that he cannot stand to do, to deal with their fake worship. Can I convince you tonight that your worship is not sincere if you're not trying to honor God with your life? It's not real. There is no in-between. There is no gray area. The only true worshipers that exist are those that after they lift their hands and sing and dance, those that are aspiring to live what they just sang. Those are the true worshipers. I want you to look at the text. He says, when you put on your next prayer performance, I'll be looking the other way. I don't know about you, but I don't want God to turn his head when I pray. If God, does, if God does not look at you when you pray, that means you're not going to get an answer to your prayers. He says, I'll be looking the other way. No matter how long or loud or often you pray, I'll not be listening. God says the prerequisite to an answered prayer is a yielded life. My soul, oh, I feel Jesus today. You got to understand, he says, if you want me to hear your prayer, you've got to give me your life. You've got to have a sincere desire. You may get weak sometimes and you may even fall, but there's a difference between a person that is truly after God and a person that just wants to use God in their time of need. God says you can be repetitious in your prayers, you can be constant in your prayers, you can be consistent in your prayers, but if you're not trying to honor him with your life, he says, I'm not listening. Watch what he said, and do you know why? Because you have been tearing people to pieces and your hands are bloody. Tonight, God is saying, we've got to get the blood off of our, off of our hands people that we've mistreated, people that we've dishonored. Oh, come on here. The Bible says the two greatest commandments is love the Lord thy God with all thy soul, mind, and strength, and then love your neighbor as yourself. So when we talk about these bloody hands, we talk about the people that we have mistreated, the people that we have defaulted in perhaps going after their spouse, the children that we've mistreated, the co-worker that we've tried to sabotage, the person in the pews with us that we mishandled. we are got to ask ourselves tonight, are my hands bloody? 
Do I have blood on my hands? If I have blood on my hands, notice what he said. Go home and wash up. Isn't that what he told us to do in COVID? Go home and wash up. Our assignment in COVID was to go home and wash. It wasn't to go home and waste time. Our assignment in COVID was to go home and wash up. Go home, get things right. Why does he tell you to go home? Because you are your authentic self at home. The real you shows up at home. He says, go home and wash up. Get rid of that stuff. Get rid of that attitude. Get rid of that pride, that rebellion. Get rid of it. Clean up your act, he says. Sweep your lives clean of your evil doings so I don't have to look at them any longer. God says he loves you. God says he wants you. God said he wants to use you. He says, but I'm not going uh, to, to, to use you and bless you over the things that you got in my way. The Lord says he's been so good to us and his grace is calling us out. His grace is saying, I'll, I'll clear the slate. I'll, I will, I will uh, clear your history. I will allow you a fresh start. Somebody type that in the chat tonight. A fresh start. He says, but you have to be willing to clean some things up. And many of us, we got to get out of our feelings. We've got to get out of our emotions. We've got to get out of our humanistic pride. And we've got to declare, Lord, clean me up. Say no to wrong. Say no to wrong. Every time that thought comes in your mind, go after something that God says you can't have. God said, say no to it. Say no. And then what he, watch what he says next. Learn to do good. Now notice here, within the confinements of this particular verse, he is teaching us that doing good is a learned behavior. He's appealing to our minds. He's saying we've got to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Learn, educate yourself on doing good. Read books that speak to the area of your weakness, teaching you how to conquer it. Read scriptures that deal with your flawed area, teaching you how to overcome it. Rehearse the verses in your mind. Confess the word. Learn to do good. Get information. Fill yourself up with information. You know, it, it's time for us to understand that many times social media is the platform of the enemy to captivate the, to captivate the minds of God's people to keep us from educating our minds in the word of God. The pictures in our news feed, in our timeline, many times serve as a demonic trap a distraction that charmed the mind so that we can't focus on God. He says, work for justice. Help the down and out. Stand up for the homeless. Begin to make a difference in the, in the lives of others. Begin to stand up for others. This is worship. Somebody type that in the chat. This is real worship. Somebody else type it in the chat. This is real worship. When you begin to learn to do good, work for justice, cry out against injustice, cry out for those who can't cry out for themselves, help the down and out, stand up for the homeless, sow into people's lives that are poor, go to bat for the defenseless, stand up for those who cannot uh, 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 fend for themselves, the defenseless. Notice what he said here. You got to do that, right? Come, sit down. Let's argue this out. God says he loves us so much that he's willing to persuade us through argument that he is right about where we are and where we need to be. Uh, the King James Version says, come now, let us reason together. God loves you and he wants to talk to you. God loves you and he wants to use you and, and he wants you to really see where he's trying to take you. He's got something so much better than what you've seen. God says he wants to transform your life. He wants to put a new song in your heart. He wants to put a praise on your lips. He wants to bring you up higher. He wants to get 
all of that negative uh, 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 thing, all those negative things off of you, the residue of sin and evil. He says, come, let's argue this out. Tell me what's on your heart. That's what God is saying. Tell me and I'll tell you what's on my heart. Tell me why you don't want to change. Tell me why you want to stay in this position that's compromising everything that I've set for you. Let's reason. Let's talk about it. Because in the end, God is going to win. This is God's message. If your sins are blood red, now somebody type grace. He says, if you just stay in my presence and let me talk to you, in the end, I'm going to change your life. If your sins are blood red, they'll be snow white. If they are red like crimson, they'll be like wool. God is saying, when you decide that you want to be an honest worshiper, I will clear your slate. Somebody type grace in the chat. Grace, 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 grace. Let me see all of you uh, type in that. I need 100 people to type it tonight. Grace, 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 grace. God says when you get honest about serving him, he will make all of your past deficiencies, your past occurrences of failure and disobedience. God said he will wash it away like it never happened. The only way you'll know that it happened, it won't be because God's looking at it anymore. It'll literally because you remember, be because you remember it. Hallelujah. He says, if you'll willingly obey, you'll feast like kings. So now he's saying, I want you to understand the power of obedience, the power of obedience that I don't just want, because many times we try to force ourselves into a posture of obedience to God without literally having a change happen within the confinements of our will. So he says, if you be willing, if you willingly obey. So you ever uh, told your child to go to their room and clean it if they wanted to go outside and play? And that child stomps down the hallway slams their door they clean their room and they come out and you say you still can't go outside and play because you did what I told you to do but you did it with the wrong attitude that's what God is saying when he's saying if you willingly obey if you will willingly obey God is saying I don't want you to just honor me I want you to want to honor me. I want it to be in your heart. I want you to get to a place where you're saying, God, I just want to please you. I just want to honor you. God is saying, I want you to graduate to a place to where you love me more than you love the pleasure of sin. To where you're willingly saying, God, I'll serve you. This is not a hard thing for me to do. God, I'll honor you. He said, if you willingly obey, you'll feast like kings. If you willingly obey, he says, I'm going to blow you up. Your life will be very productive. So understand this now. This is transactional, right? But the currency, the currency within this divine transaction is one word, and it's the word willing. You can obey God. And do it without a willing heart and still not feast like a king. Notice what he says. You'll feast like kings. But if you're willful and stubborn, but if you, you are willful and stubborn, you'll die like dogs. That's not the will of God for us. But look at what he says. That's right. God says so. God doesn't want us to die like dogs, right? He wants us to live. Look at 1 Samuel 5 and 22. I'm getting ready to wrap it up. 1 Samuel 5 and 22, God spoke to Saul when he sent him down to Amalek. He told Saul to do everything that he had called him to do, everything he had called him to do. And he told them, he told him rather, that it, to obey is better than to sacrifice. To obey 
it's better than to sacrifice. I want you to read that when you get, when you get a moment. To obey is better than to sacrifice. Let's look at Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Because uh, I, I want to elaborate just a little bit more on that part about Saul. Because God told Saul, King Saul, go to Amalek, kill everybody. Saul spared the sheep. He took the spoil and he spared the king. And he told God, I did this in order to bring you back a sacrifice of worship. But God said, obedience is better than sacrifice. It was equivalent to how we worship today in our modern context. We think being faithful to church will trump how we live outside of church. God was telling Saul, if I could put some spinners on this and put it in our modern day vernacular, God was saying, it's better for you to live for me than it is for you to shout, sing, serve, and not have any allegiance to me. He said, obedience, obedience. In other words, the highest order of worship is obedience. The highest order of worship is obedience. So I don't just have to do this when I worship, to worship. I don't just have to kneel to worship. I don't just give to worship, but I worship when I love. I worship when I forgive. I worship when I'm faithful to my wife. That is an act of worship. I worship when I teach my children the word of God. I worship when I go on my job and I don't get involved in the company mess. I worship God that way. I worship God uh, in moments when I've fallen and I go to him in privacy and I say, Lord, please forgive me. I didn't want to do that. Clean me up. Repentance is an act of worship and all of it equates to the standard of holiness. I'm closing with this scripture. Look what he said. Knowing the correct password, saying, Master, Master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. Now, Jesus is talking to the people, and he's saying, everybody's not going to be saved. Everybody's not going to heaven. He says, you got to know the correct. Uh, He said, sometimes you can know the correct password. In other words, what he's saying is, A lot of times we say, Lord, Lord, or hallelujah, hallelujah, or thank you, Jesus, thank you, Jesus. We know his name. We know how to refer to him. That's what he's saying. Y'all know the correct password. You know how to baptize. You know how to baptize in Jesus' name. You got all that knowledge. He says, saying, master, master, for instance, isn't going to get you anywhere with me. In other words, you can say, thank you, Jesus, hallelujah, you can do all that, and that's wonderful. He said, what is required is serious obedience. What is required is serious obedience. Doing what my Father wills, I can see it now. At the final judgment, thousands strutting up to me and saying, Master, we preached the message, we bashed the demons, Our God-sponsored projects had everyone talking. And do you know what I am going to say? You missed the boat. That's going to be a sad day, Demetrius. You missed the boat. All you did was use me to make yourselves important. You don't impress me one bit. You're out of here. Ladies and gentlemen, This is very serious. God is saying to us tonight, all of the work that we do in the name of the Lord, all of the worship, all of the giving, all of the serving, all of the things that we do in terms of churchism and religion, God says if our worship is not honest, if our worship is not sincere, He's going to say, you don't impress me one bit out of here. Oh, God, I believe somebody's encouraged tonight. Many of you watching me, you are a sincere worshiper. You love the Lord. 
you might not be where you want to be, but you're not where you used to be. God is elevating you. God is moving you down a fast track into greater. And I want to encourage you tonight to keep moving forward. Keep building on your prayer life. Keep building on your study life. Keep on shedding yourself of all the things that are not like God. Every attitude deficiency, every mentality that is dysfunctional, every understanding that is antithetical to your faith, God is saying, keep on coming close to me. Keep on coming close to me. I have something amazing for you that's going to change your very life. Tonight, I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. And I want you to know that God is with you. Before we leave tonight, I want you to sow a seed into the house of the Lord. Giving is an act of worship. We worship Him with our lifestyle. We worship Him with our hands. And we worship in the giving. The information to give is coming on the screen now. Text the word give to the number on the screen and follow the prompts. I love you so much. I thank God for you. I speak blessings over you and your family. I speak it over your life tonight. And I decree and declare that you shall be everything that God has called you to be. It's in the mighty name of Jesus that I speak these blessings. Amen. God bless you. I love you so much. And I can't wait to see you on Sunday morning. God bless. We give you glory. And we give you honor. He wow. What a word. Listen, there is someone that's been watching this service. While the Spirit of God is still moving, you need to make a decision. You've been contemplating accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. The time is now. Simply just put in the comments the word salvation. Someone will be connected with you to help pray with you and walk you through the next steps. But maybe you're also viewing us and you don't have a church home and you decided that ANC is the place for you to grow and go. Listen, simply download our app. In our app, you'll see the partners tab. Select that tab and if you're able to make it to our physical location, select on-site member but maybe there's someone watching us and you've been connected with us through the spirit but you cannot physically be here select the e-campus portion we would love to walk with you and be your church home maybe you need someone to pray with you select the prayer portion in our app and someone will be connected with you to pray and agree with you through what you are going through Listen, we want you to stay connected with us. Follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, and even YouTube. Listen, this is your eCampus pastor, Pastor Chris with All Nations Church, where we lift people by lifting Jesus.